So this talk is called Doctor's, a Doctor's Code Approach to uh, Medical Open Source Hardware and PPEs. Um, my name is Sean Marquez, as it says on the bottom. Uh, and I just want to give a quick thanks to the SCALE volunteer team. They've been putting on a lot of work just to set up the AV equipment and networking, and they put in a lot of effort to make these events um, possible. So I just want to give them a quick shout out. Hey, Caleb. He's on the AV team, so. All right, so this is a quick outline of my presentation. Um, just to give you an idea of whether you want to stay for this or not. Um, uh, we'll go over some quick terms, like uh, what is medical, what is a medical device or PPE as open source hardware? Um, what is a DOCSIS code approach? What are some of the stakeholder needs? Like why do we want to develop medical devices and PPEs as open source hardware, uh, let alone using this DOCSIS code approach? Uh, what's the methodology? how do you actually adopt uh, this approach to developing uh, medical devices and PPEs. Uh, PPEs also stands for Personal Protective Equipment, by the way, and, and an acronym. Um, and finally, some community resources and places to contribute if you'd like to uh, kind of foster this effort. All right, so first of all, what is uh, open source medical hardware for PPEs, right? Um, quite simply, medical devices or personal protective equipment developed as open source hardware. Which begs the question, what is open source hardware? Well, according to the uh, Open Source Hardware Association definition, open source hardware uh, developed is uh, project that is developed, a hardware project that is developed and published uh, as if it were open source software, right? That's the very basic definition. Uh, a little more on the legal side, the, it should include a license such as the CERN open source hardware license, which allows for modification and redistributions of the hardware design. Again, that's from, as per the Oshawa definition. And the documentation and design tools themselves should also be open source, right? This is from the OSI or Open Source Initiatives definition of open source software, which vicariously also applies to open source hardware. So what is docs as code? Has anyone heard that phrase? Access, we got one, two. What about docs? Has anyone heard of docs? Documentation, how about code? Okay, we got more hands. All right, so docs as code is basically the philosophy or practice that documentation should be maintained using the same tools and approaches as code, right? And we'll get into that a little bit later. But first, why would we want to develop medical devices or PPEs uh, as open source hardware, let alone using this approach. Right. So one, I think, is distributed manufacturing. So Robert uh, earlier kind of talked about this a little bit, but uh, when you have vulnerabilities in the supply chain, um, you don't have quite the vendors um, quite at your disposal. Maybe you're in a third world country and you don't have um, the the shipment supplies coming in to be able to like uh, build the devices you need in time. Um, this might be of interest, like something maybe during the event of a global pandemic. I don't know if that's ever happened. Um, and Robert also mentioned this last talk, but uh, I think it also yields just better quality products, right? Kind of by, um, uh, Linus's law, the phrase given up eyeballs, all uh, bugs are shallow, right? So if you have more people uh, looking at your, your project, like uh, more likely they're able to kind of find something that's wrong with it and then maybe contribute. 
wondering why I was having breathing problems and realized they had still had my mask on. All right. All right. So why use a DOCSIS code approach? Um, one is that it works with modern version control tools like um, Git, right? Because documentation is plain text that it's compatible with um, modern version control tools, uh, which by extension, if you're using a distributed version control system, it also allows for parallel development, right? Um, reviewing, reviewing documentation becomes like a code review, right? So if you're hosting uh, your documentation on something like GitHub or GitLab, uh, reviewing the, the content is as simple as opening up a pull request. Um, by extension, doc content can also be open source, which means you essentially open up to the um, entire world to be able to look at your code or documentation, which essentially is outsourcing your entire documentation to the world, say, hey, look at my docs, right? And by extension, um, a lot of tools have been developed um, that utilize this approach. So there are a lot of doc tools that um, will work with uh, something like a markup language to uh, be able to produce um, documentations for generating something like a PDF or HTML document uh, that might have um, be of interest to like specific stakeholders, right? And I didn't quite add it in my presentation, but uh, another methodology that you can um, for advanced use cases apply is a model-based, what's called a model-based approach to documentation. So that essentially means like the contents of your documentation can actually be stored in a very structured uh, data model, which is machine queryable, which is pretty amazing because then you can um, essentially query whatever content you want out of the documentation and any uh, relationships between model elements um, that pertain to like uh, maybe of interest to like specific stakeholders, right? But that is a much more complicated talk that I'll probably save for a future talk. Right, and um, speaking to that use case, like that might also be of interest to like the regulatory environment, um, such as the FDA, uh, or if you're trying to get like a UA certified, um, if your documentation is queryable in such a way that you can produce very specific artifacts that are of interest to specific uh, stakeholders, then you can um, essentially uh, show the regulatory environment and agencies that um, you've developed processes and methodologies that conform to whatever specific regulatory environment. All right, so how do you actually adopt the co DOCSIS code approach? Uh, I would argue you need three things. One is a language, uh, a tool, and a methodology. So um, what are, let's go through each of these items. So a language, like we mentioned, um, you might want to use something like a markup language, like markdown, restructured text. Uh, if you work in academia, you may have heard of LaTeX, uh, ASCII doc is another one. These are all uh, markup languages that are human readable and plain text, right? Which means that it's easily uh, compatible with modern version control systems like Git, right? Uh, another one which may not be as familiar is a templating language. I like to think of these as languages that help you transpile one language into another. So maybe uh, you have content that's in JSON and you want to reproduce that as uh, YAML or something that can be generated as a diagram like plant UML. You can actually uh, write templates in these things called templating languages such as Liquid, uh, Jinja, Handlebars to name a few that actually let you transpile one language into another, which I think is kind of cool. Right. And also, templating languages are usually used for formatting. So if you're producing something like a HTML document, you might want um, additional decorators that allow you to, you know, add styling and formatting to um, 
a artifact that you're producing, such as a web page. Right? Um, and the third one that's not utilized all that much, but I think is starting to uh, kind of make itself known are modeling languages. Um, so modeling languages um, are usually used in aerospace industry, but I think they're starting to kind of um, pop out in uh, the mainstream technical writing community. Um, just curious, who here has heard of a modeling language? Oh, hey, quite a few. Cool. So I listed two here. One is OML, which uh, is short for the ontological modeling language. So that's a, a plain text modeling language that's been developed by JPL. Uh, SysML2 is another one. So that's um, being developed by a bunch of uh, a working group in uh, like mostly the aerospace industry. Basically, what it means is uh, you can define uh, the, your documentation as a model as opposed to a document. Well, what is the difference, right? Um, the, main, the main core difference, I think, to keep in mind is that a model is machine queryable, whereas a document is not. So if you produce something like an HTML or PDF document, um, unless you want to pull your hair out, for the most part, it is not machine queryable, right? Whereas a model is. Uh, and depending on the complexity of the model, you can add a little bit more um, structure and semantics to give uh, more uh, more relational meaning, right? So maybe uh, you want to uh, model something that uh, has a comp uh, a composite or an aggregate relationship. You can get very abstract and complex with modeling languages that you can't otherwise use with these other languages. All right, so you got languages, now you got tool chains. All right, so some of the tool chains you'll need to apply this approach is a text editor. Um, I listed a couple here. So I personally like Vim. Um, you could use uh, Nano or VS Code, but basically something that can mutate plain text. Oops. Uh, you want to use a version control system like Git, SPN, Mercurial, uh, and then a static site generator or rendering engine that can uh, read these plain text uh, languages and then convert them into something a little bit more um, familiar, like a web page or a PDF document. Right, and then this is mostly for the project management side, but uh, if you use a platform or issue trackers, then uh, you can manage, you know, issues around your documentation uh, on platforms like Jira or GitHub or GitLab or what have you. And then, of course, a publishing platform if you want to make your documentation pub public. So some popular ones are Git, GitHub Pages, Read the Docs, Netlify, and then if you want to get a little bit fancier, you can automate some of these production pipelines so that whenever you uh, publish commits to your repo, you can automatically generate a build that uh, publishes directly to your publishing platform of choice. Right? So GitHub Actions is a built-in CI pipeline, and GitHub, uh, and GitHub and then Jenkins is another one. And then last but not least, you need a methodology. So what are some methodologies? Um, so one uh, one such methodology may be a called docs driven development. So you, this idea that you write the docs first and then implement what you documented. So this ensures that uh, your documentation, which essentially serves as an API for humans, um, conforms to what you expect your project to do. Right. Uh, another thing is a contributing guideline. So uh, style guides, code of conducts, like how do you expect your documentation to look if you're soliciting the help of contributors from the web, right? Uh, and, you know, just general um, behaviors for like how you should behave in the community. Um, if you worked in most software um, projects, you've probably heard of Agile. So you can apply a practice like Scrum or Kanban for deciding how do you want to release your documentation, right? 
And because your docs are managed the same way as code, you can have doc reviews, right? So we mentioned pull requests, um, having, you know, I don't know. Does everyone do code, code reviews? Does anyone do? OK, I have, well, <laughs> you can do the same thing for docs. All right. So some community resources, if you want to uh, um, take this approach on. Uh, Write the Docs is a community of technical writers that have essentially like their own uh, online Slack channel and talk directly to the developers that like develop these doc tools. Maybe you have um, a feature that you really need uh, for a use case, or maybe like you just want to follow an issue that's not getting uh, enough detention, you can often just go to uh, the Slack channel and then talk to these these guys directly, which is kind of cool. Um, they also have a podcast. Uh, so if you're stuck in LA traffic and looking for a new podcast, there you go. Um, the Open Source Hardware Association also uh, certifies open source hardware projects. Uh, they also have a Discord channel. And as of recently, they also have a standards working group, right? So they're trying to standardize um, or uh, develop open standards uh, very similar to like ISO, if you've um, heard of ISO, uh, that you know, open source hardware projects or uh, companies can kind of just adopt and implement either tooling around, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And oh no, his icon didn't show up. But the Mach 30 Foundation is a nonprofit originally chartered to uh, develop open space hardware, which I think is kind of cool. But they um, have recently been focused more on methodology and proce processes and tooling just because of uh, complications with ITAR and whatnot. But they specialize in a model based approach to, to documentation, which I spoke to a little bit earlier. Um, Tetra Bio Distributed, which icon is also not, oh, you know what, because my Wi-Fi isn't working right now, so that's why my build for this particular icon isn't showing up, but they're, they are a nonprofit pioneering the development of medical open source hardware and PPEs um, in collaboration with a lot of subject matters like at USC, like Daryl. Um, <laughs> Uh, and if you want to contribute to any of these projects, um, these are some of the ones I listed personally. So the uh, OSS, the Open Source Hardware Standards um, group is developing a lot of like these standards that I mentioned for specifically for like configuration management and quality management um, for open source hardware for industries such as medical and aerospace. Uh, the distributed open source hardware framework is a framework kind of like, I kind of think of it as like the Node.js or NPM package management for distributed open source hardware. Right? So how do you modularize uh, these pro uh, open source hardware projects such that you can reuse it in another project um, or, you know, uh, utilize something that someone else has already published, right? And part of uh, building open source hardware is that you also need like the tools, right? So uh, they're they're f they're doing a lot of work around not just telling you the build materials, assembling instructions, and supporting documentation you need to build the thing, but what other tools do you need to build the thing, which may also be an open source pro hardware project that has its own build materials, assembly instructions, and supporting documentation. So it gets very recursive. Um, and if you want to contribute more on the tooling side, uh, Tetra Bio is also developing a MVP command line tool called QMS CLI. So that's kind of like a, uh, a documentation scaffolding generator for uh, doing quality management um, around um, open source hardware that uh, needs to conform to these regulatory environments. Um, one of the flagship projects that Pap, uh, Tetra is working on is called the PAPRA. So this is an open source hardware respirator. Um, so if you want to work on something more tangible and physical that you can 
uh, source and build yourself for less than 300 bucks. Okay, 150 bucks. Um, you can check out the, the Papro repo. Uh, and this presentation itself is also published using a Docs code approach. So if you want to improve this very presentation, you can go to this repo. So. So that's my presentation. Let's go build some open source hardware. One of the things, so my name is Mark. I'm running the track, but I also work really closely with Sean. And one of the things I really wanted to impress on you guys is that every in our journey, like we didn't know anything about building hardware devices, especially medical hardware devices, when we started doing this. And we met every single time we wanted to do something cool we would run into this or that regulatory body that would tell us what we needed to make sure that we had. And so a lot of the work that Sean has done has made it so that every time we make a documentation change or a design update or anything like that, it gets tracked. And so those design, ma those design updates, they have to be tracked as far as the government is concerned, as far as the regulatory bodies are concerned, in order to understand your thought processes as you are making the object, right? So there's a lot that goes into that, as well as what are your testing procedures. All of that stuff has to be tracked. And what makes this tricky in hardware as opposed to software is the logistical management of getting those devices to everybody in order to make the docs. So one of the things that I, the reason I asked Sean to give this talk is it's like in, in this environment, in the hardware environment, you are targeting the document that the regulatory body wants you to write. That's your end goal. You have to say, my device meets these things. And so, in much the way that we do BDD, or behavior-driven development, right, where you say, like, my code has to do these things, you're saying, my device has to meet this document. So you write the document that says what my device has to do, and then you work backwards from that, right? And then that's, and so that's what this framework allows us all to do. So I want to make sure that we all, that that message became abundantly clear, because that's, when we talk to the FDA, we talk to NIOSH, we talk to the CDC, that's what they want to see. They want to see these docs showing that we know what we're talking about. So, any questions? So is there quality control? Is there quality control? Uh, so, do you want to answer? Is there quality on control? Um, not on the PAPRA at the moment, um, but that's one of our stretch goals is to, like, be able to um, uh, develop standards and tooling that, like, you can publish a project to um, be able to conform to. Um, right. So in the docs as code approach, as that quality problem arises, you submit a bug in, like, a Git bug. That gets logged, and then that way you track it. And that's what these regulatory bodies want to see, that you've seen that there's an issue and that you're tracking it and that you have a pull request against that issue. Like, the way that Git flow works, like, they don't even, like, when I, sh when I started talking to these guys about, here's what Git does, and their response was, I have no idea what that is. All I want to know is that you have work that goes up against an issue. It's like, well, that's, that's what we do. So. Any other questions? All right, well, one more time. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.